Hi, I'm Dwayne Sheriff with Karis Bible College. Why should we go to church? Well, first of all, the scriptures command us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together in the book of Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. And the reason for assembling is to provoke one another to love and to good works. We need encouraged in God's love for us on a regular basis and how to love each other. And of course, to do good works. We're not saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. So that's number one. Number two, church is like a hospital. It's a place of healing. It's a place of of comfort. We're supposed to come together and none of us are perfect. Church is kind of like a hospital where we're constantly being ministered to and encouraged. The last thing that is vital is church is not only a place where you receive, but it's a place where you serve. The scriptures teach we're a family. The scriptures also teach we're a body, the body of Christ. And I not only need other parts of the body in order for me to fulfill all God's will for my life, I need to supply other people that are members of the body of Christ. So church is powerful. Church is very special and near and dear to the heart of God. Remember, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If you want to be close to Jesus, you're going to have to be where Jesus is. He goes to church. All right, great question. Do I need to repent daily? The problem people have with that is, what is the definition of repent? If you mean I have to wail and bawl and and cry over sin 16 times a day, then no, I don't have to repent daily with this sin consciousness. But when I mess up, I need to fess up. We do have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, and we are to come to him and confess our sin, not to get God to forgive us. He's already forgiven us, but to receive our forgiveness. Number two, and this is powerful, repent means change your mind and your direction. So if you're asking me, do I repent daily? Absolutely. Romans chapter 12, verse two says, the only way a Christian is transformed is by the renewing of our minds. And you can't renew your mind without repenting. So I repent daily of human philosophies, secularism, and on and on I could go with a secular worldview. I'm daily repenting, changing my mind to a biblical worldview. So I personally repent daily in the sense of changing my mind and my direction. All right, how do I hear God's voice? Listen. No, really, listen. You have to learn to hear God's voice. You have to learn to listen. Mark chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus said, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Revelation 2 and Revelation 3, Jesus encouraged the churches and said, If you have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you have to choose to hear. So that's first and foremost. You have to believe you can hear, and you have to choose to hear God. But here's the game changer in my life. I didn't recognize the voice of God. God was speaking to me for years and leading me, but I wasn't heeding the leading because I didn't recognize the native tongue of God. God has a love language. God has a native tongue, and you have to learn the language of God, the language of the Holy Spirit. That comes out of the Word of God. It comes by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of love. God speaks to us in visions and dreams, intuitions, leanings, compassion. So I want to encourage you to learn the language of the Holy Spirit and then make the choice to hear every day of your life. And I promise you that if you will set your heart toward God and to hearing God and choose and believe you can hear Him, learn His language, And you'll hear him speaking to you, not only in grieving of the Holy Spirit, but I hear the voice of God daily in his passion and his love for me. And I can head in a direction and I feel the passion of the Lord, the compassion of the Lord. That's the voice of God in your life. And so just learn the language and learn to take heed to the lead and you will prosper in hearing the voice of God. All right, how do I know I'm following God's plan? Well, it starts with what is God's plan. And I remember when the Holy Spirit made this so simple to me that God's plan for our lives is a general 
overreaching plan. And then when you obey that, you get God's specific plan for your life, like who to marry, what occupation are you bent toward, and has God designed you for? And so the plan of God is to love God and now your neighbor as yourself. And so once you just love God, love people, and then serve both, that's the plan of God for your life. Wherever you are and wherever God has placed you, his plan is for you to love him there, love others around you there, and serve both. Serve God where you are. Serve people. And what will happen is, even when you make your own plans, if your heart is toward God's overreaching plan, he'll direct your steps. He'll order your steps. He will make sure, like a GPS in a car, even if you mess up and miss the turn, there's always a U-turn. I don't know if you have those in your car, but that lady annoys me at times, but she's always right. And when I miss my turn, I miss God's plan, she says, at the next light, do a U-turn. God will always cause you and call you to a U-turn when you get away from his plan, if you're loving him, loving people, and serving both, and you will hear that adjustment he makes. God is gonna get me, he's gonna get you to your destiny as long as your heart is for him and for other people. Why is the Bible important? What a great question. Well, the Bible is where we, we find God's plan for our life. The Bible is where we discover God's character, his nature, and his love for us. We are to live by faith and walk by faith, and the only way to please God is with faith, and the only way to get faith, Romans 10, 17 says, is by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God's word is important because when we're listening to it, when we're reading it, when we're meditating on it, then faith will come that makes us God-pleasers. The second thing in regards to the priority of God's word and the power of God's word is God's word is truth. And if we don't sell out to the word of God, we will be deceived in this hour. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Think about that. God's word has supernatural power to set us apart to sanctify us. And so make God's word a priority in your life. It is vital. It is again where we learn God's love for us. We learn God's plan of salvation for us. And again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel. Why am I struggling with unbelief? Because we're not believing only. We struggle with unbelief only when we believe. Do you know people that live in unbelief don't struggle with unbelief? It is when you believe God. It's when you trust God. It's when you embrace a promise from God and his character that your faith is tested. Your faith is tried. Years ago, the Lord taught me that when unbelief comes, that's a sure sign I must be believing something because you can't unbelieve when you're unbelieving. No, it's when you believe something, you hear God, and now faith comes, that faith gets tested, and so you waver. Another thing that's important and powerful is learning the different kinds of unbelief. There's different kinds of unbelief with different cures. An unbelief from a lack of knowledge. If you don't have a knowledge of the Bible, of God's word and love for you, you will struggle with unbelief. So knowledge of God's love for you delivers you from unbelief. Other kinds of unbelief are wrong teaching. A lack of knowledge will produce unbelief. The wrong knowledge will produce unbelief. People struggle with unbelief because they're believing a lie. They're believing religion and things of that nature. And the last kind of unbelief is just being carnal. We're carnal, we're natural people. And if we don't learn how to walk after the spirit, then the, then the flesh will dominate and a part of our carnality, our five physical senses, is what ministers to us unbelief. And so we have to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. That's a process in our lives. And that kind of unbelief is cured by fasting and prayer. And so there's different ways to deal with unbelief. But be encouraged, if you're struggling with unbelief, it's because you're, you're believing God for something and God is greater in you than he that is in the world. Excellent question. How do we deal with these unmet expectations? Well, it all begins with believing in a God 
that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could even ask or think. That's what creates these expectations is we know the character of God. We know the plan of God. We know God's love for us and desire to bless us abundantly. And so many times after the flesh, it's our expectations that that trap us and entrap us And the way you overcome it is that God is good, and you don't waver on that. God's plan is good. And the way I deal with it directly and personally is Romans 8, 28. I know that all things work together for my good because I love God, and I'm called according to his purpose. I love God in the bad days, and I love him still in the good days. I'm building my house on the rock. What are you building your house on? There was a story Jesus told in Matthew 7. One man built his house on that rock, one on the sand. They both heard the word of God. One obeyed, one didn't obey. But listen, the rains came and beat on both houses. The storm came. Storms come in life. Disappointments come. Discouragement knocks on our door. The way we overcome it is faith in a good God. Faith in a God that, hey, I don't know what my expectation was, but the problem's on my end, not God's. God's got something even better for me because I love him and I'm called according to his purpose. Oh yeah, how do I deal with church hurt? You may not like this answer, (laughs) amen, but you can't hurt a dead man. So if we've died in Christ and we're walking by faith and we reckon ourselves dead, then the hurt that we've incurred is simply a sign we've not reckoned ourselves dead. And God wants us to reckon ourselves dead. God wants us to get to a point that these hurts, which are just offenses, that we, Psalms 119, 165, have such great peace, nothing shall offend us. We can get to a point that we don't receive the hurts, but what if we have received it? Then you need to forgive who has hurt you, and you've got to separate forgiveness from your feelings. That forgiveness is a choice, and forgiveness simply means release people of debt. That's the simple definition. you got to release them of the debt, and now in your relationship with the Lord, He heals your feelings. It may take time to heal your feelings, but if you don't forgive, then those feelings will linger and you will be ensnared by them. You will be enslaved by that hurt. So be quick to forgive. Know that Jesus taught us reconciliation, that even if we come to the altar with a gift and we know there's an offense that we've created or an offense that others have taken, we're to go to our brother and reconcile. Sometimes reconciliation isn't possible, but forgiveness is always possible. And the healing of your hurts Remember, Jesus is nigh those of a broken heart. Many people are saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and they're just babies, and and they gotta get over it. Other people, though, really do get hurt. They get broken, and the Bible says Jesus is near the brokenhearted. And the Bible also says in Luke chapter four that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. If your relationship with God is real, I'm not condemning anybody, but if your relationship with God is real, he will empower you to forgive, and then he will heal your emotions. Wow, what is the difference between confidence and arrogance? Man, I struggled with this for years, and when I finally had a breakthrough, it was awesome. Confidence is faith in God, faith in who you are in God, what you have in God, and what you can do in God. Arrogance is faith in self. Arrogance is faith in your flesh. Confidence is faith in the born-again spirit, the new creation. Confidence is dependency upon God. Arrogance is independence from God. Once you see there's a spirit and spiritual side of you and a physical, physical side of you, confidence comes from your spirit. Confidence comes from the new creation. Confidence comes through faith in God. Arrogance is confidence in your flesh. Arrogance is is you believing you don't need God. Arrogance is pride. Confidence is true humility that, man, without God, I can do nothing. But with God and by Jesus Christ now, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. See, that's confidence. But my confidence isn't in who I am, independent of God. It's confidence in who God is and what God has done in the cross and the new creation. Arrogance is simply flesh. Confidence is of the Spirit.
where do many Christians fail in their walk with God? Wow, that, that one is a loaded question because there's not a common failure that we all experience. We all have the common condition of sin and falling short of the glory of God, but we all have different weaknesses. We all have different areas that Satan over thousands of years has learned human behavior, and he takes advantage of us in those weaknesses. So many Christians fail in different areas because of the weakness of their flesh and the wisdom Satan has to leverage that against them. With that said, the main thing overall that probably all of us fail in is, is in our relationship with the Lord. We just tend to drift from relationship to religion, and that'll, that'll ruin your walk with the Lord. We tend to, to drift from the freedom of the Spirit to the letter of the law that kills. So I just want to encourage you that if you'll stay close to the Lord, stay focused on the Lord, and work on your relationship with the Lord, so many other things will fall into place. The question is, what, what is one thing I wish I'd have known in my 20s? And that's a very, a very difficult question because that would involve regret. And I absolutely have no regret. At 20, I loved God with all my heart and where I was in my faith and in my walk with God. And the little knowledge I had, I operated in and that pleased God. Of course, today, I have much more knowledge, but I know more today than I knew then. And had I known then what I know today, I'd have been God. Only God knows things like that. And so live your life with no regret. Live every day as if it was your last day with the faith you have, the knowledge you have, and know that that pleases God.